Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this Skillfade workshop brought to you this evening by Astral Aviation Consulting on behalf of the UK Civil Aviation Authority. If you want to stay in the loop with events and resources, please sign up to our mailing list. You can do this by going to our website, www.astralaviationconsulting.com, or use the link that's just appeared in the chat box. Signing up also gives you access to the replay of this workshop and a whole host of other safety resources. This evening, I'm joined by Matt Lane, Nigel Wilson, and Dave Lewins. Good evening, everybody. Matt is the head of training. Oh, I always get that wrong. Matt is the head of training and an active single multi-engine FI and flight examiner. Nigel is also a head of training at an ATO. He's an FI, FE, and a display pilot, and also runs Easy PPL, ground school, which provides online courses for student pilots, licensed pilots, instructors, and training organizations. Dave joins us this evening from Gloucester, where he's a freelance CPL and PPL helicopter instructor. He also runs his own fixed wing PPL school, flying DA-20s and 40s, and Eagle Flight Training, a specialized ground training school teaching for PPLA and PPLH exams. Over the course of the next hour, we'll break down the workshop into easily digestible chunks. What we're going to cover, overhead joins and stalling, instruments and basic navigation, the FARTOs and PFLs, crosswind and emergency practice, along with a few emergency topics and tips. And then finally, as always, it'll be time for Q&A, which of course we'd love for you to take part in. So if you do have any questions, please do add them to the Q&A box, box, which is of course separate from the chat box. Please feel free, of course, to chat in the chat box. Just like to point out right up front, this is a 90 minute session tonight because when we put it together, we thought given that uh, all the great content, doing it for an hour just wouldn't do it justice and wouldn't allow you enough time to ask questions either. So it's a 90, 90 minute effort for us tonight. Right then, as always then, to kick us off, I'd like to find out who's with us tonight. If you're watching live, this poll will pop up on your screen. If you're watching on demand, you won't be able to interact, but please do test your knowledge as we go through the workshop with all the other polls. Also, let us know in the chat whereabouts you are this evening and also where you fly from. So who have we got this evening? PPL students, license holders, lapsed license holders or other. Um, if you are in the other category, again, please let us know in the chat box because it'd be great to understand who you are and where you are. Great. Let's have a look at the results on that one, please. Fantastic. OK, so a couple of PPL students. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, quite a lot of license holders with us this evening, which is great. Handful of uh, lapsed license holders and a couple of others. So quite a broad smattering, but predominantly license holders. Great, thank you. Okay then, right. It's going to be over to Matt now to talk about the two elements, two elements which commonly come up as concerns when pilots are refreshing or looking for their hour with an instructor, and that is overhead joins and stalling. Over to you, Matt. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, welcome, everybody. You can see the numbers, and it's great to see uh, so many people from such uh, a broad geographical spread as well. And of course, I was reminded uh, chatting to somebody over Twitter earlier as well that we might have uh, lots of airline pilots who also uh, do both airline things and light aircraft flying, or thinking of going back into light aircraft flying as well, which is great. So we're going to talk about overhead joins and stalling, but as ever, um, you get another poll uh, straight after. So let's have a look at another quick poll to kick this section off then, please. So if conducting an overhead join and you can't identify all the circuit traffic, what should you do? So answer A, follow the standard overhead join. The other aircraft will move to let you join. Or B, depart from the overhead and rejoin. Or C, descend on the dead side, as that will help you see the traffic. Or D, remain at height, fly the overhead join ground track, and only descend once all traffic is identified. So we've got a few choices there. So this is you coming in to conduct an overhead join at an airfield, but you can't identify all the circuit traffic. So you, maybe you've heard somebody on the RT and you can't identify or can't see where they are, what should you do? So basically carry on and let the other aircraft sort you out. Depart from the overhead and rejoin. Send on the dead side as that will help you see the traffic or remain at height. Fly the overhead join ground track and descend once traffic is identified. Hopefully everybody's had a good chance to have a look at that now. So let's have a look at the correct answer. And the correct answer uh, was D. And that's what most of you uh, plumped for. However, 
I would also like to say on this one that B could well be an option as well. Now the team, the team challenged me when when we wrote this poll and discussed it here as well because I said, "Oh, you can't have two right answers." Like you know, we only want one answer. But we we plumped with it because it's a good discussion point as well. B could definitely also be an option if you think the circuit is too congested for you to join, um, leaving the overhead, going away, and then coming back to rejoin at another time could definitely be an option as well. And I noticed some of you went to France B as well, so that was good and interesting to see. And also note, if you've got an air traffic uh, control service that you're working, you should also communicate any request or change of intentions on the RT as well to make sure, of course, everybody else in the circuit will also join and knows what you're going to do as well. So yeah, great to see people engaging in that answer. Thank you. So let's move on then and look at overhead joins. So here's um, a diagram and you'll be able to find that in the Skyway code if you want to look at it in detail later. So don't think you have to pour over it now. And in fact, we've just put it up just to show the general pattern. Don't worry too much about the text. You can read that afterwards. Now, if you get 10 pilots in a room, you'll get 14 different opinions on overhead joints. To be honest, it um, it it has, um, has excited club rooms and uh, airfield cafes for a long time. And if you go on the forums as well, you'll get all sorts of a range of opinions and views on overhead joins. But let, let's take them for what they are. One advantage of the overhead join is it allows you to observe all the circuit traffic without it being in conflict with it at the time. And the standard one is flown, as you can see there. But many people do get worried or confused about the overhead join. So a few tips from us to help you fly the overhead join correctly. So first thing to do is make sure you know which direction the circuit is in, whether it's left or right hand. You then route to fly over the threshold where you intend to land. And that's the, the blue portion of the track you can see in the diagram. All turns are in the direction of the circuit. And the next event that you're aiming to do once you've flown over that threshold is fly over the upwind threshold, i.e. the opposite end of the runway. And that's that green portion of the track that you can see there as well. And the runway should always be on the same side of the aircraft as the circuit direction. So there you go, that's a left hand pattern that you can see in the diagram there. The runway should always be on your left as you fly around. That's an easy way to try and keep your orientation. Then you're going to try and fit in with other circuit traffic to sequence safely, okay? So this is what it's all about. It's all about observing and fitting in with other circuit traffic. Once you've crossed that other upwind threshold onto the crosswind leg, you're just flying a normal circuit. All that black portion of the diagram that you can see there, there's nothing different about it. This is just a normal circuit. So the overhead join is basically all about getting you from the um, adjoining situation to what you know. You know the circuit pattern. That's a very familiar thing. The overhead join is all about trying to orientate yourself with other traffic, fit in with it, and get you to uh, descend and fit in safely and sequently with it. So that's what it's all about. It's a really good, easy diagram. It's in the Skyway code, and the link will be in the chat box, so you can have a look at that as well. Now let's quickly talk about some other types of join. Another diagram from the Skyway code as well, and it's a nice, simple diagram. So let's very quickly look at what we've got here. So we've got the downwind join, which involves directly joining the circuit parallel to the runway in the downwind direction. Gotchas with this one are that you don't slow down enough by the time you hit the end of the downwind leg or you join too close in, or you conflict with established circuit traffic. So it does take um, a little bit of awareness and speed control. The crosswind join involves joining the circuit height at the dead side, 90 degrees to the runway, then turning downwind. It's worth mentioning here that, again, you need to be aware of traffic doing an overhead join and descending dead side to try and end up in the same crosswind position. So again, being aware of other traffic that may be joining this out of the RT is very critical. And the base leg join involves joining directly to the base leg. And here you really need to watch the downwind leg carefully to make sure you don't cut ahead of established traffic. And finally, the straight in approach. Now this can often be very contentious and it can be seen to be barreling in ahead of others or people may describe or talk about it, things like that. So again, this is very important that you're 
of fitting with other established traffic or other aircraft joining the circuit as well. Remember, if you're making a really long final approach, you need to report long final prior to four nautical miles from the runway. And we talked about that in one of the RT workshops and the RT uh, around the circuit is also very important to make sure you're reporting correctly where you are. And again, we can, uh, there's some really good uh, new uh, safety sense leaflet on RT that explains some of that really well. So that's, that's overhead joins and some joining. Hopefully that was a little bit of a refresher and it may be that where you fly, you frequently do um, the same kind of join all of the time. So um, it's worth getting a chance uh, to practice some of these. And maybe for your hour with an instructor, if you don't go uh, somewhere and do an overhead join, or you, you always have a particular join because of noise abatement, it might be worth practicing some of the other types of join on your hour with an instructor. Now let's move on. And the second bit that we want to look at is stalling. Now, with stalling, many people just train for test and then they forget the different stalls in the test scenarios and why they're there. Now, often schools can perhaps teach them as academic exercises rather than scenario based. And what we recommend is really treating it scenario based and relating it to the phases of flight where you may mishandle and experience them. So this is really an area where we can go rusty on because we tend to think of it as an academic thing to get through the test and we forget about how it relates to our real life flying once we're out and about doing, uh, doing our, uh, our flying. So a couple of things to remind yourselves about with stalling. Uh, the first thing is the hazel checks. These are the checks before stalling, sting aerobatics. Hopefully these are pretty familiar to everybody. And even if it's been a long time since your training, these are, these are kind of ringing bells in your memory. Now, before deliberately entering the stall, we need to check that it's totally safe to do so, particularly because you're gonna be restricted in ability to maneuver for a short period of time. And you might not want to worsen this situation by operating the aircraft outside of its limitations or conflicting with other traffic. Now, these checks are, are pretty universal. I would expect most of you uh, of experience knew something very similar to these as well. Ideally, you should do these from memory, and that's not to show us being really clever or show how cool we are or anything. It's so that we can keep the lookout going as we're completing these checks. That's really why we want to do it <clears throat> from memory where possible. It's also worth mentioning airframe parts of the checks as well. Often we tend uh, sometimes skip over these quite quickly, but this is the, um, the time to set the flaps for the type of stall you may want to practice and other aircraft, you may need to very clearly check things like brakes off or the gear is up or down or, uh, or slats unlocked if you're flying historic types or for example, a chipmunk, remember uh, very much has to have uh, the brakes off um, for spinning and things like that. So those are the hazel checks. Now move on and just look out turns. They mentioned them as part of the hazel checks, but why are we doing that? Well, what we're doing is to clear the airspace in which we're going to be stalling before we enter the stall. Two common ways of doing this are the uh, 180 turn or two 90 degree turns in opposite directions. And what we're doing in these turns is looking out for other aircraft. We're looking for the surrounding airspace and the ground below us for built up areas. And we're also trying to check that we're not getting or not going to go in near any cloud or penetrate cloud if that's a factor on the day as well. So you can see there where we put some arrows just to show where you should be biasing your lookout because that's the area that you're going to stall in. So that's the, the piece of airspace that you want to try and clear. And the other thing is once you've done your hazel checks, you really need to get on with the stall because you will travel a fair bit of a distance. So if you delay, actually completing or practicing the stall after your lookout turns, you will have moved to a different piece of airspace from that that you've just cleared. So once you've completed your lookout, you've rolled out wings level, the time is then good to get on with the stall. Don't try and delay that. Now, let's just quickly remind ourselves of two build up aspects to the stall. So the first one, the signs of the approaching stall limb. So again, there's a good safety sense leaflet, which we'll link to, that expands on some of these diagrams in the text. 
So we might see some or all of these as we approach the, the store. We've got a high nose attitude, which gives us a reducing airspeed. As the airspeed reduces, we might start to feel some light buffet through the control column or the controls. And we might get a possible store warning device. That might be a light or an audio warner if you've got one fitted to your aircraft. So those are the signs that we're going to stall if we don't do something about it. So let's imagine that we don't do something about it and we let the situation deteriorate. So we get to see some symptoms of the actual stall. So, so here we go, there's a few more on here as well. So the airspeed's going to remain low. The buffet becomes heavy buffet. So that's, you're going to feel noticeably through the controls and you might start to feel it through your seat and the airframe as well. The controls may feel ineffective. The nose attitude may drop and that may happen before or in line with some of these factors. And you may get a possible wing drop. So there's the roll or yaw to one side. And I think as somebody who's just picked up in the chat box as well, the rate of descent will increase even if the nose attitude remains high. You may hear it sink, high rate of descent may be talked about as well. So those show that the aircraft has entered the stalled condition. Clearly we don't want that. We want to have hopefully recovered the situation by then, but if we do end up in this situation, what do we need to do in order to get out of it? So the way to recover from a basic stall and gain full control, we know is the standard stall recovery. Now, a couple of things just to unpack this very quickly. Um, we want to move the control column forward to select a no or lows attitude. That's to reduce the angle of attack below the stalling angle. How much to do that, you'll learn by practice. Now, of course, this will recover the aircraft from the stall, but it's also going to lead to a further height loss from that we may have already been experiencing. Now, the object is to try and minimize this height loss. So we're going to simultaneously apply, uh, apply full power as the angle of attack is reduced. And this is about minimizing the height loss as well. As we apply power, it's important to maintain balance using the rudder, as it says there, to keep the ball in the middle. Um, but we mustn't use the ailerons until the angle of attack has been reduced. We need to get the wings back flying, both of the wings back flying, before we start to use the ailerons to try and roll the wings level. And then as it says there, once the aircraft has been recovered from the stall, uh, we can level the wings and we can accelerate, climb away, retracting flaps gear as required as well. And there's one final point I'd like to point out there, and this is from this leaflet that we've linked to as well. It says here, once the situation is stabilized, review what happened and why. That's a really important point. So don't just dismiss it and think, oh, okay, well, that was a bit of a bad day. That was a bit of lack of intention. Why did it happen? Is there a reason why you stalled the aircraft? And it's well worth reviewing that. Are you dealing with some other kind of technical or control failure? Or have you, have you, did you inadvertently leave flaps down? Or have you got some kind of issue there as well? One of the aircraft I fly, it's not unknown to select the flaps up and the indicator will travel, but there may be a problem with the drive and the flaps stay down, for example. So that could be one scenario uh, where, where it's happened and you may want to review uh, why it's happened. So I wasn't here today to give you a, a lesson in stalling again, but hopefully it's a bit of a refresher and it's just a few top tips and a few things to think about as well. Some of these CAA leaflets and diagrams are really nice, simple depictions to remind you. And I think they're really worthwhile having a read of when you get a chance uh, from the chat box. Thanks everybody. Cool, thanks Matt. Um, just picking up a couple of points um, that have come in since you've been chatting. Um, so something from Roy, which is an interesting point he makes here, which is uh, overhead joints seem to be okay for group A aircraft movements. However, some microlite or gyrocopter traffic can be near circuit height at the end of the runway and conflict with joining traffic. So that's worth bearing in mind for all of those that you are, those of you that are at airfields or locations where you might have microlites and gyrocopters. So MB that as well. That's a good one. Um, I was just thinking back to um, my stalling uh, back in back in the day. I'm showing my age now. That um, yeah, I spent so long doing the most perfect lookout turns, and it might just drive my instructor crazy. So I just go with it. 
So yes, Matt, you, I do take your point entirely. It's got to be a balance, hasn't it, between the a good lookout turn and actually then uh, carrying out the exercise. And one final thing before we move on to Nigel, I've got a good question here from Philip, which we'll tack on now, if I may, which is uh, on the overhead joins. What if you're approaching the airfield from the dead side? How would you perform the overhead join? I'm pretty sure that's just um, fitting with the pattern as per Matt. Do you want to expand on that quickly? Uh, in view of time, shall we take that in the Q&A at the end? Because okay, we'll do yeah, it the Q&A at the end. That, Philip, yeah. we'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, brilliant. Let's go to Instruments and Basic Nav with Nigel. Okay, hello, everybody. Um, so once again, before we get into the detail, let's have a quick poll. So the question is then, uh, when you're carrying out a selective radial scan, we're going to talk about that in a second, for straight and level flight, what main instruments should you be looking at? Is it answer A, the altimeter, the vertical speed indicator, the air speed indicator, and the fuel gauges? Or B, the fuel gauges, the VSI, and the turn and slip? This is straight and level we're after, remember. And C, attitude indicator, VSI, turn and slip, and the voltmeter. Or is it D, the attitude indicator, the altimeter, the HSI, that's a horizontal situation indicator, or in, in, uh, in other terms, a DI, if you like, and an ASI, the airspeed indicator, once again. So there are your choices. This is for straight and level. And like I said, what main instruments should you be looking at? And now this, you might think it doesn't apply to PPL, because any instrument flying applies to a PPL. It's in the skills test. and uh, you know, you want to be up to speed with it in case it happens for real. So that's your chances. Let's have a look at the results then and see where we got. And the correct answer was D. And most people got hold of that correctly. So um, we'll move on from there and hopefully expand a little bit on what that's all about. So let's have a think about this thing called selective radial scan. And the important things here are the individual three words, which are selective, radial, and scan. So let's take each of those in turn then. So selective means that we need to choose an appropriate instrument depending on the maneuver we're performing, um, along with how frequently that instrument needs to be looked at. So as an example, when you're climbing, you tend to include the engine temperatures and pressures more frequently than you would in a scan for straight and level flight. And when you're turning and uh, approaching a required heading, then you would scan the HSI or the DI more frequently than the airspeed indicator. So it's all relative stuff. So similarly in a climb or a descent, when you're nearing your target altitude, You'd want to scan the altimeter more often to make sure you don't overshoot your required altitude. And you'd want to look at that more frequently than you would the turning turn coordinator. So that's selective. You know, we're selective about in which instruments we look at. So radial is the next important thing because we shouldn't just go round in, for example, a circular pan looking at the instruments in turn. The master instrument is the attitude indicator, the one in the middle of the screen there, because it gives the most realistic view of the attitude of the aircraft in pitch and roll. In other words, the same information you get from looking outside. So we always move from the attitude indicator to look at one other instrument, for example, the HSI or the, the DI, and then come back to the attitude indicator before moving on to another instrument, which might be the altimeter. So in other words, the scan radiates out from the attitude indicator each time. So that's radial. So let's have a look at, uh, talk about the scan itself then. So how long should you look at an instrument for? Well, long enough to take in the information, but not too long that we end up lagging behind what the aircraft is doing. So a good rule of thumb, if you like, is that we change the instrument we look at with the pace of a grandfather clock. And I'm in a grandfather clock, so it's like tick, tock, tick, that slow, yeah? So second and a half, two seconds, look at an instrument and then move on to the next one through the attitude indicator. 
So an important thing that you must remember is that you must continue doing this radial scan while you're trying to fix a problem. So in other words, if you find you're at the wrong altitude, you become so fixated on regaining that correct altitude that you fail to maintain the heading. And then you've got another thing to fix. So it's really important to keep the scan going, juggling all the balls, if you like, whilst you correct a problem or an error of your own making. <laughs> so don't forget, Equally important, one tiny little instrument in there is the suction gauge. And that you really do need to include in the scan, since that will give you the earliest indication of a problem that can lead to a serious confusion, which in most aeroplanes means that you're going to eventually lose the attitude indicator and the HSI or the DI, as I said, normally. So instruments with gyros don't usually suddenly stop working. They gradually give more and more erroneous readings, which can be difficult to spot unless you use a cross-check technique. So for example, if the AI is showing a slight diving turn to the right, yet the RPM, airspeed, direction indicator, vertical speed indicator, and the altimeter are all showing steady indications you might well deduce that the attitude indicator has got a bit of a problem. So other things to avoid here is to uh, avoid fixating on one instrument for too long, not scanning the appropriate instruments and allowing errors to compound without correcting them. In other words, you really have to be on the ball and fix something quickly whilst not uh, creating another problem elsewhere. So that's it about sort of instrument flying. So we're going to talk about dead reckoning nav now or DR nav. So DR nav. So it's a skill that you ought to refresh now and again, because no doubt most of you fly with a moving map and things like that, which I'm all for. That's, let's not get it wrong. Let's make life easy for ourselves and use all the tools at our disposal. So let's have a quick refresh about what is DR. Right. Dead reckoning. Dead reckoning nav is basic navigation where we are using an educated guess, let's be honest, an educated guess based on forecast winds initially as to what heading we might need to fly to get from A to B and how long it will take to get there. Bit of a miracle, really, that it ever works in practice, but it does. OK, bearing in mind it's forecast winds and our best guess about things. So invariably, this hardly ever works out accurately. So we need to constantly amend our estimates of headings and timings to update our best guess to ensure we actually do reach our intended destination successfully and within a reasonable margin of our planned arrival time. So you can make dead reckoning navigation easy or hard for yourself from the outset. And that's what this slide is all about that you see in front of you here. So let's take a, a quick look at each of them. So first one is plan your leg lengths. In other words, the lines on the chart, even if you break up the lines into about 20 minutes or so. If they're too short, the cockpit workload goes through the roof. And if they're too long, then the checks between your waypoints might mean you can get too far off track for your comfort, uh, making regaining track and time difficult. Uh, number two then, uh, for each leg, have a sensible halfway checkpoint to make the maths easier if amendments are needed. Don't go into fifths or thirds or unequal distances if you can help it, because it just makes the maths really, really difficult. Stick to halfway and then it's easy. Uh, you can use good, e you should use good, easy to recognize waypoints and avoid complicated airspace, even if it means your route is a little bit longer. Try it one day, take a chart, draw a straight line to your destination and work out how long the route takes for a given wind. And then do the same again, but put a dog leg in your route, about 20 miles, you know, laterally to one side or the other, and then work out what time it uses up. And you'll be surprised how little time it takes extra, maybe just a few minutes. And we're talking, you know, three or four minutes, not 10 or 11 minutes. The other thing is the higher you go, then the easier it is to navigate generally, providing you can see the ground, of course. 
navigating at low level is really, really difficult because you can't see as far ahead. When setting off for each waypoint, do a gross error check, something like, you know, something simple like I've got the C on my right and land on the left. That's a really big gross error check to make sure you are roughly in the right direction. And you want to do that before you then look at the compass alignment. So we want to make sure we're going in the right direction before we start spending time doing other stuff. Don't constantly, this might seem a bit odd, don't constantly have your chart out looking at it. So the whole point of dead reckoning is to fly your planned heading and altitude accurately. And you won't be able to do that while you're constantly looking at the chart, trying to identify everywhere ahead, left and right of track. And that method that we've just talked about, if you put the chart away, also forces you to look out. And that includes looking out for other traffic. Um, it also means you're a more relaxed pilot instead of constantly stressing about where you are. So having put the chart away, when you get to two minutes to your planned arrival time at your next waypoint, that's the time to pick the chart up and establish your actual position in relation to where you should be. The last two then, keep the navigation log up to date. Note the times you arrive at waypoints. Knowing where you were and at what time can help narrow down the problem of where you are if you end up lost. You haven't got to just remember I took off an hour and a half ago, some, you know, uh, 200 miles away. So last one, then, if you're not sure where you are, ask for help sooner rather than later. All the air traffic units with radar can pinpoint you in seconds or failing that distress and diversion on one, two, one decimal five. They don't bite. They're there to help you. And if you squawk 0030, that's an international squawk that signifies you are lost. When you make the call to them, they will already be on your case and help you and be able to help you out. Don't mince your words either. Do a pan call and say you are lost. Don't do things like, oh, I'm temporarily uncertain of my position. We all know what you mean, you're lost. So just say lost and you'll get the urgency that you need and the help that you need really quickly. So one other thing then, just to do with uh, coming back to DRNAV called, uh, how do we get back on track? So that's called, one of the methods is called the standard closing angle. Now I'm not gonna go through this slide in any anger, okay? It is a very, very simple thing to do, irrespective of all the lines that you see on the chart there. So I'm going to give you an example. In an aeroplane that uh, generally travels at 90 knots, there is a standard closing angle, which you can calculate. It's always going to be 40 degrees for an aeroplane that travels at 90 knots. And just look at the picture at the bottom there to concentrate on that. Let's assume we end up being four miles off our track. That's easy to do, judging your distance from your line. OK, bearing in mind, looking out the window and seeing where you are. And then all we have to do is to turn into the direction that we want to go back to get back on our track by our standard closing angle. For an aeroplane at 90 knots, that's 40 degrees. So we turn right by 40 degrees and we hold that new heading for the same time in minutes as distance we are off track in nautical miles. So we turn right by 40 degrees, we fly that heading for four minutes because we were four miles off track. And after four minutes, you'll find you are pretty much back on your line, okay? So that's really important that we want to get back on our line. We don't want to go from our new found position to aim for our destination, because that new route from where we are to where we want to go is, in, 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 the, in business terms, it's not risk assessed. We haven't sat down and looked at, you know, the minimum safe altitude, what airspace we might need to do, go into, who we might need to talk to. It might be different to our planned route. So the whole idea is to get back on your original track. And that's the really important bit about that. OK. Brilliant. Thanks, Nigel. The magic of DR nav and standard closing angles. Um, it's occurred to me as you're talking through that, Nigel, that, you know, 
I wonder how it's done in a helicopter. And now conveniently, we also <laughs> we happen to have Dave Lewins with us today. He does a lot of helicopter flying. So Dave, in terms of DR nav in a helicopter, how do you guys go about that? It's a very good question. Uh, the workload in the helicopter is quite different because you haven't got trim. So you're hands on all the time. You have to balance cockpit organ organizations, what it's all about. Um, and we very much stress accuracy, but you can't trim. This is the big deal. So to you, you really have to be able to fly straight and level, which sounds really straightforward, but in a helicopter, uh, 1800 feet doing 80 knots in an R22 or whatever, uh, you've only got to lean down to change the, uh, the transponder or the radio, and you can be off heading by 10 degrees. And of course, then it takes us back to what, what is navigation? And navigation is all about the plan and then flying the plan. So unless you can fly straight level, that's a big deal. So we really keep it very simple in helicopters. We do two types of navigation. We track crawl, where we physically put ourselves over the, uh, over the points uh, from the start point along the track. And then we do a heading hold. Uh, and a heading hold is exactly uh, as uh, your standard closing angle, except we only pretty much ever use uh, the halfway point, double the angle, assuming you've, of course, held the, the right heading all the way to the halfway point. So to answer your question, that's pretty much all we do. Yeah, interesting. Right. Thanks for that, Dave. And thanks, Nigel. Right, let's go to Matt again now for PFLs and Ifartos. Over to you, Matt. Brilliant. Thank you. So practice force landings and engine failures after takeoff. And I'm pretty much talking about fixed wing here as well. Um, some of the gyro people on, and probably Dave will probably be shaking his head at some of this stuff as I talk about it, or it might be quite different considerations, but we can explore that in some of the Q&A as required. So before we get into the detail in this section, as ever, let's start the section with a poll. So the poll, please. If you suffer an engine failure after takeoff, what should be your number one priority? deal with the source of the engine failure, fly the aircraft, tell ATC what the problem is, or brief your passengers on what you want them to do. So this is you, you're climbing out from an airfield, expecting to go for a nice lunch out somewhere, you have an engine failure to take off. What's the first thing that you should be doing? Dealing with the source of the engine failure, flying the aircraft, speaking to ATC to let them know, or briefing your passengers what's happening. What do people think? So the correct answer that we were looking for is B. And let's have a look at the results. 99%, yeah. So it's a pretty obvious question, isn't it? We all think about uh, this. Uh, we sat here you know, with our coffee or our drink, listening to this webinar. That's an easy answer, isn't it? Well, it is. But clearly, a lot of people, when they suffer it for real, don't necessarily instinctively do that. They get distracted or focus on other things. So uh, let's have a look at some top tips about PFLs and the FARTOs and think, well, why doesn't it happen so obviously and easy in practice? Now we could, and indeed during training, we will do some fairly long and detailed briefings on, on both of these subjects. We don't have time for that today. <clears throat> so I'm just going to cover a few top tips, like I said. But one thing to take away is, Force landings and uh, engine failures have to take off. They're really both variants of the same thing. It's all about force landings. You're having to put the aircraft down somewhere and in a manner and in a time scale that you weren't expecting to. Uh, it's just that one happens at potentially a much lower level than the other. So it gives you far less time and options to deal with it. So let's have a look at the key sequence of events that we, we will try and consider in these scenarios. So the priority, as we've already said, fly the aircraft. What's your best guide speed? Can you instinctively get a suitable attitude and select that attitude to attain that best glide speed? That's something to really hopefully get instinctive at practicing. We then want to select a suitable landing area and we'll talk about how we can help ourselves do that in a minute. And we want to assess the surface wind. And if it's in doubt, you can't remember what a surface wind is, one of the best things you can do is, especially if you're close or have not been flying for a long time, just use the direction of the runway you took off on, okay? So if you can't remember, your, your brain's fog, just think, I took off on runway 25, I'll use 250 as the wind. It won't be that far out. 
and altitude. What's your height? So remember that the height of the ground you may be flying over, you might be flying on Q and H. So your actual height over the ground might be quite different to what your altimeter is showing in a course landing situation. If you can, try and get an emergency call out to try and get some assistance uh, or at least let a suitable agency know that you've got an emergency scenario. And then if you've got time and capacity, diagnose what kind of scenario are you facing or what options have you got to deal with it. Again, we'll talk about that, um, expand on that very shortly. So landing area selection, and particularly at low level, the priority is absolutely to maintain speed and control. Providing you keep the aircraft at flying speed and under control, engine failures are unlikely to be fatal. Hopefully you will get an outcome where you can walk away from it, even if the aircraft is pretty much uh, over to the insurance company from there as well. Uh, and if an engine failure after takeoff happens, generally landing ahead is safer than attempting to turn back. But lots and lots and lots of debate about that on forums, on YouTube videos, all sorts of things on it. But generally, landing ahead safe and attempting to turn back. If you have more time, you might want to use the five S's, as you can see on the screen there, to assess the suitable landing area. You want to get a good big size, check the surroundings, get a decent shape, doesn't have to be a perfect shape, but a decent one, and the surface. There's some really good websites uh, out there as well that you can look at in order to assess, um, uh, help you assess crop and things like that. Some of the gliding websites have some really good uh, advice and pictures on that of all the different crops, uh, and which of course change by seasons uh, here in the UK with different farming seasons. And try and avoid significant slopes as well. So that's the landing area selection. The other thing I mentioned is the different types of engine uh, malfunctions. So moving on, if you've got some height and you've got time and capacity to try and diagnose, I um, uh, recommend to you, you might want to think about engine malfunction scenarios in these three different ways. Are you looking at either a mechanical failure, a non-mechanical failure, or are you dealing with a fire situation? And I've put some things there that might help you think which leg of that decision tree, if you like, you're going down there as well. Now, you might also want to think about, would you even attempt to try a restart in two of those scenarios? I offer to you no. If you've had a major mechanical failure, you've lost oil, the propellers stopped abruptly, there's been loud mechanical noise, you're not going to want to try and restart that engine and fly on it. Same if you've had a fire. If you manage to put the fire out, you don't want to attempt to restart it. If you've had a non-mechanical failure, it's some kind of fuel problem or a magneto problem, you may want to attempt to restart. And that might help cut down your options and channel your decision making. Quite often on tests and come to our examiner clinic in a, in a month or so's time, if you want to discuss this, I often get candidates that I give a fire scenario to, they put out the fire, then they go, oh, I've got a bit of time now, I'll attempt an engine restart. You really don't want to be really doing that. So that decision making tree or uh, scenario flow, that might be something you might want to think about and incorporate in some of your emergency practices and training with your hour of an instructor. So try and give yourself or try and think about lots of different scenarios, not just the standard, right, close the throttle, bang, engine failure. Engine failure is going to manifest itself in all sorts of different ways as well. And partial engine failures are getting a lot of discussion and attention at the minute as well. Now, there is some material and literature that's starting to come out, and certainly the CA and the AIB and some of the accident reports, there's now much greater recognition that partial engine failures are a really challenging scenario to deal with as well. Some of you may have some thoughts on that in the chat or in the Q&A on the end as well. And the final one, that I'd like to make the point on is all about your forced landing aiming point as well. This is just a takeaway to think about. Many of you, when your instructors will uh, have been practicing forced landings with you, may have talked about an initial aiming point and a final aiming point or such things like that. But what are they talking about there? It's just a point to remember that where you're aiming for in any kind of landing or forced landing, especially a glide approach scenario, that aiming point in an ideal scenario you will round out over that aiming point but remember you travel 
a bit of distance before you get to the actual touchdown point as well. So bear this in mind when you're selecting an aiming point in any force landing, or even if you something that you can practice in your, in your glide approach practices, either at your home airfield or if you're doing an hour of instruct somewhere unfamiliar as well. Have a look and see where you're aiming for and where you're actually touching down. And for your aircraft type, at normal kind of glide approach speeds and that, just see what kind of distance you're actually using in that flare as it's got it on the slide as well. And that's something to think about when you're then using your aiming point relative to where you want to touch down in a force landing in your or in your glide approach scenario there as well. The last two things I'll mention, which sadly haven't got time to discuss it tonight, but it'd be fascinated to, is ditching. Don't forget ditching. It's another part of uh, another type of force landing. It does happen. A friend of mine uh, had to ditch his Cherokee 6 he was instructing in off Jersey very recently. You've probably seen that in the news. And they got away with it and were uh, very safe today because they were practiced. They talked about it. They rehearsed it and they had all of the kit and they had all of the kit to hand. So it's definitely a part of a force landing that you want to think about as well. And the second one, which would be a fascinating point to discuss, is all about ballistic rescue systems, BRSs, uh, where you can pop a parachute and descend under a parachute. Not just Cirrus and that, but I've got them these days. Lots of microlites, lots of permit aircraft are starting to get them as well. What's the decision making with those? What are the considerations? When would you use the BRS? When would you not use a BRS as well? Be fascinated in the chat box to hear if any of the pilots out there have got BRSs and what you think about them and how you think about using them. But that's going to be something that's really got to play a part in our training for force landings going forward. That's it for me on force landings. Loads we could talk about, but there's just some top tips and things to think about. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Um, having a, just picking through some of the chats, pick out some interesting points for me. Uh, Chris Terry's raised a really good point, uh, which I wholeheartedly stand by, which is decide before you take off what you will do in the event of an, of an engine failure. So I would always advocate doing an emergency brief. And I, even if you're on your own, I used to chunter away to myself quite happily with my emergency brief so that it becomes instinctive as and when that you know unpredictable scenario occurs. So I would wholeheartedly agree with Chris on that one. And Roland brings up a really good point around... Um, a lot of people in the US seem to have died in the past year due to stalling during a fartos, right? And which comes back to Matt's point, which he made right, uh, which was number one on that slide, which was fly the aircraft, right? Got to fly the aircraft, which of course sits under Aviate, Navigate, Communicate. You've got to fly the aircraft first and foremost. Good stuff. Right, let's move on to practice, practice, practice with Nigel. Everyone loves a bit of practice. Okay, Over they do you. indeed. <laughs> uh, to stop those stalling during the uh, engine failures. Anyway, uh, before we get on then, let's have another quick poll to make sure you're all still with us. Uh, so, if you're faced with a time critical emergency, you should uh, A, complete the checklist from memory, then review it later, only if there's time or B, get the checklist out straight away and complete all the items from it just to be sure. C, not worry about any checks until you've told ATC you've got a problem. Or D, complete the checklist items, but only when you have time. So just to reiterate, this is a time critical emergency that we have here, okay. So let's have a look at the answer then. And it was A, of course. So you should complete the checklist from memory. And then if there is time, review it. In other words, review it from the checklist itself to make sure you haven't missed anything. And pretty much most people got that. There's a few there. Um, uh, complete the checklist items, but only if you have time. Well, really, you want to do the checklist from memory, uh, you know, as best you can, you know, not if you've got time. But as we said before, it depends on the scenario. Aviate, fly the airplane first at all costs. Right. So let's have a think about practice, practice, practice then. And we're going to have a look at a couple of things. Uh, we're going to have a look at crosswind landings in particular, and we're going to have a look at handling some emergencies and things like that. So let's have a look at crosswinds then. So 
I'm not going to teach you to cram, um, grannies to, to suck eggs here, but basically there are two main methods that you can employ uh, dependent on how you've been taught. Uh, first one's crab and the second one is wing down. So we're going to have a look at each of those in turn then. So let's have a look at the crab method. Um, so basically once we're on the final approach, we need to crab the aeroplane or in other words, you know, point the aeroplane so it's not pointing down the runway. Um, but into the wind. And the secret here is to make sure that your backside is tracking down the extended center line of the runway. We don't want to arrive at the threshold at an angle, you know, from one side or the other. We want to be flying, tracking the aircraft down the runway. And whatever the heading is that allows that to happen, that's what we're doing. As you can see in the picture there, the nose is off to the right, but the airplane is physically moving down the runway direction. So when we get to the threshold, then we round out in this technique, we round out while we are crabbed. In other words, the nose is not pointing down the runway. We still round out in this position. So to do that, uh, the problem is, is obviously the nose isn't pointing down the runway. And if we were to touch down, we'd go off the side pretty quickly. So what we need to do then after we've rounded out is we need to apply rudder to bring the nose of the aircraft into line with the runway that it's about to land on. So lots of people ask, well, how much rudder? Well, the, uh, the answer is enough rudder, <laughs> enough constant pressure of rudder to keep that nose pointing down the runway. It's not guesswork, okay? Lots of people think uh, it's a bit of a black art, crosswind landings, they're not. There are two distinct things you need to do. First one is to bring the nose in line with the runway by using rudder. Okay, so then the next bit comes. Now, if we didn't do anything else in this condition that we see in the picture, the wind's coming from the right, then basically, if we didn't do anything else, the aircraft would drift to the left of the center line. So somehow we need to stop that from happening. So what we do is we apply some aileron, in this, in this case, some right hand aileron or right wing down to let the aeroplane slip into the wind by the same amount that the wind is trying to move the aircraft sideways. So there are two distinct things you do. The rudder keeps the nose straight down the runway to make the wheels, to make sure the wheels line up down the runway. And the second thing is we use enough aileron to keep ourselves over the center line of the runway. Too much aileron and you'll slip in the opposite direction. You'll go to the right, too little, and you'll go to the left again. So again, it's something you can see and evaluate is not guesswork. So once we've got there that position, we can then hold off using those cross controls, in this case, left rudder and right aileron, hold off in the usual way to reach the landing attitude and then land as normal. OK, when we have gone onto the ground and are beginning to slow down, aerodynamically, the controls lose effectiveness as the speed decreases. So in particular with the aileron, we would need more aileron in to make sure we keep that wing on the ground, the upwind wing on the ground to stop it being uh, picked up by the wind. So that's really the crab technique. And there's lots of things you can do and practice you can have with uh, instructors. So let's move on to the next one then that sometimes use, and that's called the wing down technique. And basically, this is effectively the same as what we've just done close to the runway, but we start a lot further back up the approach. So we don't crab, we actually use rudder to point the nose down the runway and enough aileron to maintain the center line of the runway. And we hold that all the way down to the actual runway. Why we tend not to use that uh, in most scenarios is because it's pretty uncomfortable for passengers. Uh, it's much more comfortable to use the crab technique to, to do that. OK, so the final one then is just not on the screen here, but is uh, one that the commercial airliners tend to use uh, because you can't afford in a big commercial airliner with a huge wingspan to put a wing down. So what they do, because the wing will touch the ground, the wingtip will touch the ground, basically. So what they then do is they use the crab technique and just before touchdown, they will use some rudder to attempt to get the nose into line with the runway. 
they don't use any aileron because purely the inertia of the aircraft will continue to force the aircraft down the center of the runway. In other words, it would take some time for the wind to have an effect and blow that aircraft off the center line. That takes practice and skill to judge when to put the rudder in, which should be just before you touch down. Okay, so that's really the crosswind uh, techniques, the crab method and the wing down method. And as I said, the one for the big wingspan aircraft, uh, which is a little bit of a combination of both. So let's move on and have a look at practicing emergencies then, which is the other thing we talked about. So you need to think about what you're going to do when you practice emergencies. So the golden rule is, is take someone with you because you're going to be out of practice. Um, there is things to think about with regards to taking someone with you with regards to regulations, because if you're flying a particular air part 21 aircraft, and effectively, you're not allowed to practice emergencies uh, or forced landings or anything like that if you have a passenger on board. And of course, in a single pilot aircraft, if you are the captain and pilot of the aircraft, everybody else on board is a passenger. The exception to that would be an instructor and a student or an instructor and a pilot under tuition, which is why we can do it as an instructional piece. The third thing to think about is, is don't get distracted with your emergency to such an extent you fail to notice other things such as traffic, you know, or the low flying rules, you get a little bit enthusiastic with your force landing and go a little bit lower than you really ought to have done. In addition, remember to use touch drills. In the heat of the moment, you don't want to actually pull the mixture to idle cutoff. Been there, done that, seen it done multiple times, okay? So just be careful, and that's another reason to have somebody with you. Um, for, uh, for flight critical emergencies, okay, as we talked about on the, on the poll, you know, uh, the ones, the flight critical ones are the ones where the aircraft is descending or a major safety issue is happening like a fire, okay? So you should perform the correct procedure from memory. And then once you've done that, think, once you've, once you've done what you think needs doing, then if you've got time, run through the written emergency checklist to check that you really have done all that it says in that checklist. Double check you haven't missed anything. For non-critical emergencies, it's just the opposite. Things like radio failure or alternator failure, you, you, these are not time critical. You've got the luxury of time, so you can use the checklist straight away. Go through the checklist. And when you're practicing these emergencies, don't just run your finger down the list saying the words. If it says pull the circuit breaker for the alternator field, how many of you know what circuit breaker that actually is? Have you actually looked at it and identified that particular circuit breaker? If you haven't, go off and do it now. Well, not right now, but you know what I mean. <laughs> OK, so uh, surprise yourself might be a little bit odd, but I know several flying organizations that by the door leading out to the aircraft from the clubhouse, they have some sealed envelopes. And what we do as instructors, we pick up one of those envelopes and take it in the aircraft with us. And then during the flight, we will open the envelope and it will have an emergency that none, no person in the aircraft would be aware of at the time as to what, do, what, what was going to happen. So the instructor would read the emergency out and that is what would then be practiced. So it's uh, you'd be surprised how inventive people can be when they write these emergencies in these little envelopes. So it's a really good idea. OK, a little tip, maybe surprise your friends, you know, give them a little envelope, say when you're next with an instructor or next with a flyer with a friend or whatever, have a look and see what you think of this in the air. OK, so emergency top tips and tricks then, if we can move on. So uh, uh, Chris already alluded to some of this, when and what to brief, checklists and flows and carbon monoxide, which we're going to cover very quickly. So first one then, when and what to brief. So in here, what we're talking about are the briefings and lots of people get confused between what we call the passenger brief and the captain's brief. The passenger brief is done, you know, uh, to uh, your passengers, includes things like what the brace position is, what to happen, what's going to happen in the emergency and a forced landing and things like that. In other words, you want to brief your passengers 
before stuff happens while you've got time to explain it. You don't want to be explaining to your passengers how to do the brace position while you have an engine failure that you're trying to deal with. OK, the other one that Chris mentioned is what we call the captain's brief in the gliding world. They call it eventuality. So this is a brief to yourself, not your passengers. And usually it's done just prior to take off. In other words, just prior to you falling ready for departure. And it basically brings all of the information to the forefront of your mind that you might need to make use of in the next 30 seconds to a minute during the departure. So things like what's the best glide speed? What's going to happen if the engine fails if I'm on the runway? What happens if I've got some runway left? What happens if I haven't got any runway left? Which side of the, you know, which, what am I going to look for? Am I going to look to feel to the left or to the right? Where's the wind coming from? All of those things. That's for you to brief. And you should do that, as Chris said, even if you're by yourself. That's your captain's brief. So uh, our pre-flight checklist uh, includes passenger and emergency briefings that was produced with the flight recorder, actually. And it's a good source to help working out what each brief ought to include. And there's a link to that in the chat box now. OK. Third thing, then, is uh, checklists and flows. We've talked a lot about checklists, OK? Um, We've already talked about aviate, navigate, communicate. Well, perfect checks in the event of an emergency are all well and good, but the key thing is to fly the airplane, keep in control and do what you can. Uh, and when you can do the checks, do them then. An engine failure at 500 feet or 5,000 feet will give you very different timelines and an opportunity to either some, to do some or all of the checks. No one, remember, won any prizes for doing perfect checks, then crashing into a tree. OK, so similarly, don't run checks blindly. In other words, be sensible about what you need to do. Matt talked about this. You know, if you've got an engine fire and you shut it down, well, don't go through a restart checklist then, because that ain't going to end up in a good situation. The other thing about checklists is all good checklists should have what we call a flow to them. In other words, they shouldn't dot you around the cockpit from here to there to down there to up there to left to right. They should have a flow to it. So most good training organizations will create their own checklists based on the POH and they will flow the checklist. So you might start between the seats, go up the center console, along the panel to the left and up and over the instruments to the right. And the checklist would allow that to happen naturally. And it makes it a lot easier to follow a checklist when you haven't got it, when you use a flow because you inherently will do what is required. Last thing then, quickly talking about carbon monoxide, because it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment. So carbon monoxide is a silent killer. Don't underestimate it. I can speak from personal experience of having CO poisoning uh, in an aircraft. OK, fortunately, I was OK and managed to land the aircraft. My passenger wasn't so fortunate. They collapsed as they got out. So it is very, very real. Um, so let's talk about, well, what do you do if you have an abnormal carbon monoxide level detected. So let's think about the two types, main two types here. We've got um, uh, the active ones, which is the one in the middle of the screen there. In other words, the ones that uh, generally give you an active alarm. Um, uh, you can hear it or you can see it. Um, be careful though, sometimes it can get masked by ambient noise and especially if the batteries are low. Some modern headsets also incorporate CO detectors now and uh, within the headset itself. The other type is the CO detector on the left, which are the passive ones. In other words, the black spot ones, they turn black. But you need to remember to use, to have a look at those regularly. And what we do is we modify our good old friend, the Frida check, where on the last A, so it's uh, a fuel, radio, engine, direction, altitude normally, we put another A on there and it becomes air and you look at the carbon uh, monoxide detector to make sure it's not black. So what do we do if we have got um, some uh, CO indications? So obviously we need fresh air, so you can open all the fresh air vents, uh, open all the windows if you're able to, open the doors even if you're able to, on the Cessna's maybe PA28, depending on the type. Uh, turn off all cabin heaters, okay? Um, Descend to a minimum safe altitude to increase the oxygen content. Not, you know, even, you know, from 5,000 feet down to 1,000 feet is going to help. 
uh, determine the nearest airfield and divert to it. If you're not within easy reach of an airfield, consider a precautionary landing. It really is that serious, okay? Because whilst you have the capacity to, to, uh, to execute a landing, let's do it before we become totally consumed by the carbon monoxide. Do make an RT call, make it a PAN call, because you need an urgent, uh, and it's an urgent situation, you need help, you need priority over other aircraft that might be at your destination airfield that you've chosen. And keep a constant check on your passengers and other people in the aircraft. So remember that carbon monoxide, it's, it's euphoric. It makes you feel as if everything is just fine, when in fact it just plain isn't. Um, CIA have completed a CO detection pilot survey in August 2022. And the findings uh, you'll see in the chat box now. Brilliant. Thank you, Nigel. Very informative. As always, um, I couldn't help but thinking, you know, I'm in an inquisitive mood this evening. I was thinking about all this emergency stuff. And again, I come back to Dave. Dave, how do you deal with emergencies in a helicopter? You know, we have, uh, we have emergencies too. They're either time critical, the same as an aeroplane, uh, in the same way as an aeroplane, or, uh, or you can sit on them for a while. Obviously, if an engine fails in a helicopter, you're going down quite quickly. Um, but just as a little... Uh, explanation for those of you that don't know how helicopters glide. They glide actually very well. You just have to turn the helicopter from getting the airflow from above and getting pulled along by the engine uh, to the airflow coming from below. So the, uh, the, the most important thing uh, to do on a time critical emergency like an engine failure uh, is stop the uh, rotors from stopping. So continue their rotation is all, all, uh, is all important. So we teach very strictly enter auto rotation. So fly the aircraft, it's exactly the same, aviate, navigate, communicate. Uh, we fly the aircraft, we enter auto rotation, we turn into wind because the helicopter in auto rotation really uh, does need a headwind. In fact, when we're practicing auto rotations to the ground, we won't do them unless there's about 10 knots for practice, uh, because there's, there's a, a fair, uh, fair chance that you could uh, uh, get it wrong and just bend the, the helicopter, and that obviously would be bad on a scale of good to bad. So we enter auto rotation, we turn into wind, and then we pick a landing spot. Um, obviously, we turn into wind, uh, assuming that you've got uh, the, the, the room to do it. If the sea happens to be uh, towards the wind, then you might want to turn away from the sea, carry on round and then end up facing back into the wind. Um, and then uh, uh, once you've picked the field, you then fly an appropriate auto rotation uh, by changing your speed in the same way as uh, with a glide. Uh, in the same way that we have our half row V squared S for lift, uh, if we can get the, uh, the speed higher, then we'll go faster. So even though, and it's the same in an airplane, of course, if you lower the, if, if you're going to have to stretch the glide, uh, as we always teach people not to do, it's very alien to put the nose down to gain the speed. But then once you've got the speed, you can lift the nose back up and you'll go an awful lot further. So uh, that does take a bit of thinking about. Um, once we've uh, made our assessment of getting into a field and we either S-turn in the same way or we do, may do a 360, uh, we lose about 1,200 feet in a 360, 1,000 if you're good, 1,200 uh, uh, if you're slightly out of practice perhaps. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll fly all the way down to uh, a flare and we, we go into a flare between 65 and 70 knots in most helicopters. Uh, so that you can then turn that inertia as you're going down at about 2,000 feet a minute, which is only, it sounds a lot, but it's actually only less than 20 miles an hour. So if you did nothing, you would survive it. Um, but we then turn that energy into rotor uh, speed uh, by flaring and speeding up the rotor. Uh, and then you can then stop the helicopter at about five or six feet level the helicopter and then as it starts to sink you can then raise the lever and cushion cushion your way down to the ground so that's how we deal with an uh, with an engine failure and you're on the ground from uh, if you're at say 1500 feet uh, you're on the ground within 30 40 seconds so it uh, you you just you have to pick your routes that you've you've got 
plenty of places to land at any time. Fascinating stuff, um, and some and similar but different. But yeah, very fascinating. If we do have any um, helicopter people on this evening, or you know, who even fly fixed wing on helicopter, if you want to ans ask any really hard questions of Dave, then please feel free. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Right, moving on to some questions. Right, we've got a bunch in the uh, Q and A, which is good. Uh, we have had one sent in from Jim, so I'll go for that one first, if I may. Uh, this is probably one for Matt, please. Uh, from Jim, he asks, what is the minimum height one can descend to during a, a fan stop? He thinks it's 500 feet. That's right. So it is um, it is 500 feet. Um, I, I'm not here to give a, a law lesson, but there's various um, differences between um, SARA and what's in UK regulations and that as well. And we can perhaps, uh, um, it's quite complex to find some of the UK regulation, but yeah, 500 feet. But the key thing here is it, it's uh, the way I think of it is there's a bubble around your aircraft. Yep. So we call it MSD, mean separation distance. The way to think of it is if you drew a 500 foot big bubble all around your aircraft and within that bubble, uh, you can't let um, things like uh, persons, vessels, vehicles, structures, livestock uh, penetrate that bubble as well. So it is possible that you could uh, descend uh, below 500 foot uh, AGL above ground level but you've got to maintain that 500 foot bubble around your aircraft. Remember things like runways also uh, count as uh, structures potentially if you were say uh, operating at an airfield where you weren't operating in accordance with the permissions or uh, in permission in in accordance with a clearance as well. So, um, you know, if you were just using a, a, uh, uh, a you know, an airfield that, you, you, you know, disused airfield or something like that. So um, my advice is really uh, there is no, there's no, I mean, if you're out practicing engine failures, uh, there's no, uh, there's no medals for being heroic with it. So it's generally quite clear to yourself, I would suggest, and to instructors when the, uh, the field selection is going to be successful. Okay. So you want to make it, um, you want to go and descend far enough to make it realistic and to make it um, viable that, you know, you give yourself confidence that you would have made that field. Um, but there's, don't push it, is, is my honest advice, because uh, you could think that you're out there, oh, I'm in a field, not, and then suddenly you get some walkers come out, or you see somebody a tractor motoring across, or livestock, and then suddenly... Uh, you've burst your 500 foot bubble. So don't push it is my advice. Um, you know, some of you uh, may be involved in motor gliders and that as well. And there've actually been accidents during field landings where motor gliders have failed to climb away because of performance or they've not taken into account rising terrain and that as well. So do it enough to be uh, realistic and give yourself confidence that your field section would work, but don't push it is, is my advice. Uh, and I, I Nigel probably has the same uh, with his instructors and other that but he's standardizing. Once, once the aiming point is steady in the windscreen and you've descended to a decent height, you can be pretty confident that uh, the, uh, the the force landing will be successful. I don't know what Nigel thinks on that. No, absolutely right. You don't you don't want to put it to it. Even on in, in the in the skills test and the examining space, you know, uh, it's the examiner's license which is at risk. So once I'm happy that the, the, you know the person uh, under test has, has clearly been able to make the field you know sometimes i'll call it at 800 feet and say let's go around good points thank you cool right let's refer back to philip's question from earlier so what if you are approaching the airfield from the dead side how would you perform the overhead join So, well, I'll go first and I'll see what Nigel. <laughs> I was going to wait and see as competition to see who's going to speak first then, but yeah, go for it. <laughs> right. That's so, two examiners get 15 different answers, right? Go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm sort of itching because I'm wanting a whiteboard to draw this, which is why I'm <laughs> struggling. Yeah, but the way I describe it is think of the overhead join uh, as a roundabout in the sky. Okay, so when you uh, approach the overhead at whatever height it is, whether it's a thousand foot or circuit height or if the airfield's got a particular frequency, but it's typically around about 2000 feet uh, above the airfield and that as well. 
think of that 2000 foot point above as a roundabout in the sky. You need to join the roundabout from whichever direction you're going, travel round the roundabout, and then you come off the roundabout um, over the threshold in order to then go and descend on the dead side. OK, so that's that's how I think about it and how I talk about it. It's very it's kind of difficult to verbalise as opposed to, to drawing a board. But think of it. It's a circular roundabout. Join it where you need to and get off where you need to. That's how I think about it. I don't know what Nigel thinks. Uh, spot on. Yeah, I agree. Oh, did I just hear that you both agreed? Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, mark it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Take notes. It's recorded. It's recorded. So exactly. Good. Right. OK, good. Uh, we've got another one. Uh, someone anonymous here. Please, can you specify how the precautionary landing varies from the forced landing in terms of steps, so steps wise? You want to take that one first, Nigel? Difference between precautionary yeah, landing okay. and forced landing. So, uh, the, the, the main difference is, is a precautionary landing is something you are planning to do because you need to put the aeroplane on the ground. You still have full control of the aircraft, you haven't got any engine problems or anything else like that. So that's the difference between a precautionary and a forced landing where you've got no choice. The engine, you know, the aircraft is not flying, not maintaining altitude, the engine stops, so you're going to end up in a field. So the precautionary landing, there's various ways of doing it, but basically you would normally make a series of passes, if time permits, to inspect the surrounding area and the surface which you're about to land on. But apart from that, that's the main difference is that one's planned. And uh, you know, and you are you have made the choice to actually land in a field, and the other one is forced upon you, in that the aeroplane has decided it's not going to maintain altitude, and you have got to make the best of that and pick a field and go for it. Precautionary landings, of course, you're going to get a second stab at it if you get it wrong, because you can always climb away and do a missed approach and have another go at it. On a forced landing, you got one chance, and that's it. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, this one's for Dave, I think. Uh, this one's from Ray. He says, what are your thoughts on using simulators, X-Plane, et cetera, to practice simulated emergencies? Good question. Uh, with, my about that? with my helicopter hat on, uh, I've actually, uh, I've got Microsoft Flight Sim. I've also got X-Plane and I'm working on the helicopter models, but they're not very good uh, yet. I'm sure they will be. Um, there are simulators, you pay about 30 grand for them uh, in the States and they're still not certified in the UK, uh, but they are really excellent uh, and they use X-Plane, interestingly, um, to uh, practicing any emergency, if it's time critical and you're going back to the uh, um, auto type situation, uh, then the models aren't very good to my, uh, in my opinion, unfortunately yet, as I say. But certainly for, um, for the likes of uh, other uh, non-time critical emergencies, uh, I think they're fantastic. Uh, and you know, just going through a flow, making yourself uh, fly uh, two places, straight level talk to people, especially with uh, Microsoft Flight Sim with the uh, live ATC and what have you, it's, it's really excellent. I also uh, got myself a, um, a VR thing that I'm trying to work on uh, for my school. Uh, and get that working, but it makes me feel sick at the moment, so I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Um, does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. Interestingly, yeah, from a former life that Dave and I both experienced, they used to have um, the old cardboard cockpit as well, I'm sure. Oh, yes. well, everybody here will remember that, right? And that was really good at getting the checklist out or giving yourself an emergency and the touch drills for stuff around the cockpit, mm -hmm. you know, and then referring back to the checklist, wasn't it? So there are, okay, X-Plane, Microsoft Flight Sim is clearly, you know, much more technology advanced than a bit of cardboard. But I thought they were actually really good because it got you looking in the right place and touching the right things at the right time. Mm -hmm. So I think there are several different ways of doing it. And I guess the broader question then is, is that sort of stuff valuable to do before you then get into the aircraft? And I would uh, would have suggested that it probably is. Any more familiarity you can have with any form of um, emergency prior to it happening for real is never going to be a, a bad thing, I think, notwithstanding. Um, Sorry, go uh, on, I'd just like to add on that. Bad weather day, you can't go flying. You go to the flying club. Where is everybody sat? Where is everybody sat? They'll be in the tea bar, coffee bar, cafe, sat around chatting on phones or the uh, rest of it. What's outside? Totally free training with resource, whole lineup of aircraft, yeah. Bad weather day, your lessons cancel, take your checklist, go and sit in the aircraft 
and practice your checks, practice your emergencies and practice your flows. It's absolutely free. It's the easiest thing to do and nobody does it. <laughs> so, and, it's yeah. be- and it's better than a bit of cardboard. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Right. Thank you. Uh, this one's from Paddy. He says, would you recommend one approach over the other for low wing aircraft, referring to crab wing down, Nigel? Would you recommend <laughs> one over the other? Um, I, to be honest, it's, I, I think it's personal choice. I mean, the, uh, the high wing aircraft, obviously, you've got more scope to getting more wing down because there's more distance between the wing tip and the ground. But equally, you know, you can you can still do some wing down approaches, even in a PA-28. You obviously need to be a little bit more careful um, uh, with that. Um, and bear in mind, you know, how, how far off the wing tip the ground actually is. You don't go too mad with it. But then again, to be honest, if you're in a situation where, you know, you, you're not able to maintain the runway centre line by using that method, then the chances are it's probably outside the, the, um, the, the published or the recommended limits of uh, the POH anyway. So um, personal choice is what I would say, but just be careful with the low-wing aircraft. Don't know what Matt um, thinks. Yeah, I think it, it's very type dependent um, uh, on what you do. And the, what's also kind of uh, interesting is, is tail draggers uh, and that as well. Um, so that introduces a whole other dimension with three <laughs> pointers and wheel landing and that as well. And one thing, if you've not done any tail dragging experience, uh, if you've got uh, access to a club that uh, uh, can offer tail drag or you can get some instruction or you're thinking of, I don't know, perhaps you've got a big birthday coming up and somebody wants to buy you a, you know, a present. Oh. <laughs> like that, yeah. um, you know, go and do go and do an hour or so uh, tail wheel flying because it, it, it's really good at getting your handling uh, quite sharp near the ground and it's also just makes you really think about what you're doing and why you're doing and that I can really recommend it even if you're not going to fly tail draggers all the time um, it, and you're you know a normal nose wheel gear pilot it, it's really good getting some experience it, it really sharpens you up it's well worth doing. Cool um, this is another question this question is from Wayne <clears throat> back to overhead joints I think what you're trying to get at is what's the correct procedure for overhead joins where the runway is long? So you know, a really long runway, say 10,000 feet long runway. Um, I think he's referring to something like akin to a midfield join because you wouldn't necessarily fly across the upwind threshold because the runway is so long. So given your roundabout analogy, Matt, is there anything to consider with exceptionally long runways for overhead joins? So the key thing here is to think about remember what I said when we were looking at that diagram and there were some different coloured sectors. So what the overhead join is all about is joining the established circuit pattern. OK, so whatever you've got to do or wherever you're going to position in your overhead join is to get you from the overhead to join the established circuit pattern. So it's no good doing something that puts you in a different place to the established circuit pattern and cuts ahead of people. So if the established circuit pattern has a crosswind from the end of the runway and is downwind and that's what the other traffic doing, that's what you need to fit in with. So even if you need to kind of space out or flatten off bits of it, whatever you need to do is to fit in with the traffic that you're joining with. So that's 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 the key thing. Cool. Thanks. Um, we've got a question, another one from Paddy on RT. Uh, this is quite specific to London, so uh, we'll see what the collective thoughts are on this one so when on london fizz 124.75 and you're about to cross the boundary to london fizz 126.6 do you need to change frequency or remain on the same one given it's likely to be the same controller and do you need to inform them i can answer that go for it um yeah um the they will just tell you so they're they're just different areas so if you're flying uh, on one uh, fizz uh, and you go into the next one, they'll just uh, hand you straight across. You'll stick with the 1177 squawk and uh, and they'll have all your details so you don't even have to pass your message. That's it. That's straightforward. Yeah. Um, this one's a, uh, let's talk about a quick stalling one here from Mustafa. Uh, this is this is definitely got to get the examiners and the instructors going. Should you centralise the control column or positively push it forward in the stall recovery? <laughs> We've been arguing about this since the dawn of flying, I think, haven't we? Uh, I'll let Nigel go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So the, the bottom line is the action that you're actually wanting to affect is you want to reduce the angle of attack of the wing. That's the key thing that you need to do. So, um, you know, you basically need to get that to happen by moving the control column forwards. All right. Now, if you've got the control column held all the way back in a Cessna, by the time you've released the back pressure, the aircraft's probably unstalled itself anyway. But that won't be the case for all aircraft. And that's the important difference. So the important thing about the mantra or the standard stall recovery is control column centrally forwards, OK? Uh, means that you move it forwards until the symptoms of the stall cease, OK? Mm -hmm. So that's the important bit, and now I'll let Matt carry on. 100% <laughs> uh, agree. Control column centrally forward until, you know, the light buffet uh, and all the audio warner or whatever has, has gone, yeah, until you've removed that. You need to continue to pitch forward until you've you removed the, uh, the, the the indications that you're stalling and then you cover. Now, if you over pitch, we'll recover from the stall, but what you're going to do is increase the height loss. So that's why um, when the training and testing environment, we're always trying to get people to finesse that stall recovery. And that's not because we, we're trying to just be pernickety about it. It's because we're trying to get them to recover from the stall uh, with the minimum height loss because what it's all about is if you stall in the circuit or on final approach close to the ground you want to minimize the height loss to give you the best chance of climbing away safely from it as well the other thing to say is uh, if any of you are into aerobatics or spinning as well you need to be really really clear um, about what is the spin recovery techniques for your particular aircraft and this is all about mega mega amounts of pre-flight study and being really clear on it as well one aircraft type that i fly and instruct on the spin recovery technique is um, to centralize the control column another aircraft type you need to continue moving the control column forward the firefly might have to go a long way forward might even be on the forward stop if you just centralize the control column like you do in the grob 115 you won't recover from the spin. So it's all about really knowing the technique and that as well. So we talk about standard stall recoveries and that. Um, standard spin recovery is not a thing. You need to be uh, clear with the types. Uh, I know Nigel might like to add to that because you're obviously got mega amounts of aerobatic time in some quite esoteric machines. <laughs> uh, yep, yeah. and there's, there, yeah, the, the, gen generally speaking, the standard, standard spin recovery usually works because the standard spin recovery it, it, the wording of it is you know the control column centrally forwards until the magic word is until yeah. something stops okay oh. and that means that if you get it all the way forwards and it's hard on the forward stop then that's where you hold it until the spinning stops so it's uh -huh. all very it's esoteric and there are there are some other refinements to certain different types that will assist in recovering the uh, the spin sooner. Uh, but generally speaking, the standard spin recovery will work on pretty much every aeroplane I've been in. Good stuff, thank you. Right, that was a mammoth 87 minutes worth of uh, chat. So thank you to everybody. Thank you to all the participants as well. Really enjoyed the questions, really enjoyed the interactions this evening. It's been great to have people from as far afield as Scotland, down to Suffolk, over to Shropshire, over to East Anglia. So that's been, been great. And a broad smattering of people in terms of PPL students, et cetera. So that's been great. I do hope you've all been able to take something away from this evening. And as a reminder, if there's anything you'd like to revisit, a replay of the workshop will be sent to you via email with a list of resources to support you. Uh, once we finish tonight, a survey will pop up in your window. Please do take the time to fill this in as your feedback is really valuable to us. Uh, if you're wondering what's next, uh, what we've got next coming up in terms of workshops to please keep an eye on our website and social media channels or through CAA Skywise to see what's coming up as we kind of alluded to already we've got a, a general aviation drop-in clinic coming up shortly and then there'll be a whole bunch of other stuff tech and various other things so keep an eye on those channels we have run out of time um, so it does only remain for me to say a big thank you again to Matt, Nigel and Dave your participation i've learned so much about helicopters this evening not that i've really <laughs> probably more than i need to know but uh, <laughs> thanks for that we'll be seeing more of dave uh, in the coming uh, workshops as well so again thank you uh, and again once again thank you to everybody for your participation and we look forward to seeing you all again very soon
Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.